This is Join Us in France, episode 349, 349. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we look around France so you can best enjoy France as a destination. We talk about places you might want to visit in France, French news that relate to travel, French culture, history, gastronomy, and everything it takes to have a lovely time in France. Today, I bring you a conversation with my friend. And Elise Riven about the liberation of the Mediterranean at the end of World War II. We've talked about the incredible feats of valor surrounding the liberation of France via Normandy, but that was only part of the job. Lots of Allied troops participated in the liberation of Algeria, Corsica, and Provence all around the Mediterranean. And unlike Normandy, 50% of the troops who participated were French. But not only French, I bet some of you have relatives who fought in those battles and they are rarely acknowledged because all we ever talk about is Normandy. August 15th marks the 77th anniversary of the landing of Allied troops in Provence. And it's an amazing story that Elise and I will share with you now. This time, the France travel update on how to get your health pass and QR code is at the beginning of my discussion with Elise and not after the interview. Stay tuned for that. If you like what we do here at Join Us in France, consider supporting us by visiting joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique to check out my cookbook, Join Us at the Table, my self-guided voice map tour and my services such as my itinerary review where I help you craft the best vacation in France specifically for you. And the best way in, to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. Starting in September, the newsletter will get sent out twice a month because, lesson learned, if I don't schedule time for writing the newsletter, it doesn't get done regularly. It's now on the calendar, so it shall get done. <laughs> Bonjour, Elise. Bonjour, Annie. Today we are talking about something that uh, we don't know that much about it, but we know enough to be dangerous. We know enough to be dangerous. Oh, I like that expression. Yes, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, <laughs> right. especially in our hands. Right. Yes. <laughs> but we definitely want to pique your interest. So you might want to read it, or I've heard that there are some documentaries about this. People who are yes. history buffs really dig this. Anyway, it's the liberation of Corsica and Provence. And Provence, which happened in the month, uh, beginning in the month of August, which is why it's appropriate to talk about it now. Right. So the, yeah, the, the liberation of Provence uh, took place on the, f it started on the eve of f the 14th of August, 1944. So it was just a few months after after D-Day in Normandy. Normandy. And the year before in August was the liberation of Corsica. Right. And we're, we'll, we'll talk about both of those. But first, I want to mention an experience you had getting the uh, COVID QR code yes. for your sister. Yes. Tell us all about that. Okay. So this is for everybody out there who has family or friends who are intending to come to France or who have already arrived by some chance in France with a vaccination certificate, but who have not been able to change it into a QR code, which is the only valid document that uh, the French authorities and other European authorities actually do accept. And it turns out that if you have all of the vital information about when and where the vaccination was taken, taken place, which should be on the certificate, and you have information about the person, the name, etc., if you give all of that information plus a little bit of other information, for instance, use your address if you have a permanent address in France as a residence and... Or your you, hotel address. Or your hotel address if you have to. And you go to a pharmacy, a pharmacist, with all of this printed out, 
it is possible for them to go into the French system and create a certificate that has the QR code. And uh, this was done for me by my local pharmacist yesterday with a little help from a younger assistant who was a little bit more savvy about uh, computer things. <laughs> uh, we could say that helps a lot. And it took not more than seven or eight minutes to punch all of this in and print out this lovely document called the European Community Vaccination Certificate with a QR code on it. Right. And that is what you need. It is your open sesame to everything. Getting in a train, getting on a plane. In, in France. In within France. France. In yeah. France. In France. And going anywhere you want to go, going in and out of any building you want to go to. Uh, right, because right now they're not asking for this health pass very many places, but more and more will be requiring it. And in your case, your sister is flying into Paris and, and spending a couple, a couple of days. days, but then she flies to Toulouse. That's right. And she was worried about being able to board the plane Correct. to Toulouse. Correct. Right. And so uh, last episode, I uh, told you that our friend Patricia had been able to do that for her sister, mm -hmm. who's coming to visit, uh, using her French pharmacy. And so uh, Elise... This corroborates it. Right, right. Elise did the same thing, and it can work. It can work. But the first person you talked to said, no, no, that's impossible. That's right. It can't that's be done, right. blah, blah. So you had to negotiate. So, so you have to negotiate. And of course, uh, I am sure that there are some pharmacists, especially in Paris, who are going to be quite familiar with this very e quickly because there'll be, there are people already arriving in Paris. And especially for travel, not necessarily for going into a museum, but for travel, you do need a document like this. It's a legit. By the way, it's also important to know that you do not have to be in France to download the application called Tous Anti Covid, and this application is very useful to have on your phone because it indicates if you activate it, it indicates if you are in contact anywhere with anybody who is testing positive. But also, once you have this application on your phone, if you have the QR code come up on your screen of, of your computer, you can just zap that code and it will enter into your phone and then you are really set. You don't right. have to worry about anything. Right, right. So we just wanted to mention it. So for people who are who don't have a sister in France, right. uh, the other way to do this is uh, apparently the Hôtel Dieu in Paris. So that's the hot, that's not a hotel, it's a hospital. Right next to Notre Dame. Right next to Notre Dame. If you're facing Notre Dame, it's on your left. That uh, it's that hospital apparently has taken up doing this right. because a lot of people were going to the vaccination center on the Parvis de Notre Dame, right. the, and they were turning people away. And they were turning people away. Their job is to vaccinate people, not right. to create QR. I mean, they do create the QR codes for the people for they the people vaccinated, vaccinated, but you know, it's not the same. So they are sending people to the Hotel Dieu. There's also a vlogger. Uh, an American vlogger, can't remember his name right now, but he, he said that uh, he did it at the La Pharmacie de l'Opéra, uh -huh. so by the Opera House in Paris, and apparently they charge 20 euros to do this, which, you know, it takes a few minutes to do right. it, so why not? I mean, I think it's fair to charge it, a little bit of it's money. It's not exorbitant. No, it's not that much money, and you, you need, you know... I, I don't it's worth it. It's worth it. It and, really is. And honestly... Uh, <laughs> I, if you think it's frustrating that you have to do that to come to France right now, I understand it is frustrating and we all hope that it's going to go away. But right now, French tourists cannot visit the U.S. at all, at all. At all. They cannot enter the U.S. at all for any reason. So, you know... <laughs> If you're if you're uh, worried about needing to jump through s some hoops, at least you can come. You yes, know? that's correct. Right. That's so, correct. Um, and once you arrive in Paris, you do if you have a vaccination certificate. Believe it or not, most museums are accepting it now. It is going to be true that in at least another week, it is very possible that restaurants are going to enforce having to have this QR code. So right. it's really to worth... To eat inside anyway. Yeah, to yeah. eat inside, so it's uh, worth it. One thing that you need to consider if you're wondering if you can or cannot come to France at this time, and we're recording this very early August uh, mm. 2021, so, right. it, you know, uh, keep that in mind if you're listening, you know, in the future. But if you're wondering if you can come to France right now, well, the, the only trouble is that the U.S. will require you 
to test negative to return to the U.S. Yes. And we know now, because of the CDC, that it's possible to be positive and not sick. And so if you happen to catch it on, while you're in France and you, test neg- and you test positive, you won't be able to board the plane back to the U.S. even though you've been vaccinated. Correct. So that's a worry for some people. Um, and I, I do understand that, you know. So if you're coming for family reasons because you have a relative here, then obviously you're probably willing to take the chance. Just like Patricia's sister, Elise's mm-hmm. sister. We know other people who come to visit their, their you know, family. their family. Your, your, your son or daughter married a French person and you're coming to visit. Well, if you test positive, you can stick around for a while, uh, mm-hmm. for a while until you start testing negative again. Because if you've been vaccinated, you're not going to be sick, right. you know. So it's not such a big deal to test positive, except that it will stop you yep. from going home. So I don't know. And this is something that you need to, uh, to, to decide for yourself. I mean, right. It's a, it becomes a question of weighing the, the consequences and just being careful. That's all too. All right. Being very careful. And something very cool that I heard on a p- podcast that I highly recommend called This Week in Virology, Rackin Yellow, who's a PhD virologist, whatever, he said that uh, if you test people who have been te- vaccinated against polio, any of them, 100% of them, could test positive for polio if you tested them. It's just that they don't catch polio. So nobody cares. They don't mm-hmm. have polio. They don't, de- they don't develop the disease. Right. But they could test positive if they've been in contact with the virus. And so it's the same with uh, this coronavirus, especially this new very uh, easy-to-catch Delta variant, right. that you, know, you could test positive. But if you're not sick, huh, who cares? Uh, you know? But yeah. you have to be careful because you do pass it on. That's right, you problem. can pass you it can on. You can pass it on. Yeah. That's the biggest To people problem. who are not vaccinated. Right. So get vaccinated. Okay. Get so, vaccinated, yes. everybody. Get it. Let's get this over with. <laughs> oh, please. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about, let's talk about this uh, uh, liberation of Corsica and Provence. But before we do that, another thing that happened before both of these was the liberation of North Africa. Right. Which, which Algeria. Is, right. So the Allied forces landed in North Africa in 1942. 1942. And pushed back the Germans. Germans. Right. And we're not going to go into all of that in detail, but my my mother, who was a young girl growing up in Algeria, because Algeria was French at the time, she remembers uh, and she was talk she often talked about the American soldiers showing up uh, in her village and she lived in a very small little place that had American soldiers who distributed candy and chewing gum and things. I mean, these are things that these kids never had before. My mother had never had that sort of, you know, goodies. It was really important. And the funny experience we had is that years later, and, you know, I was in my my mid-20s, and I had lived in England for a couple of years, and I came back home before I went to the U.S. And so I was in my parents' home, watching a movie and I don't remember what the movie was but it was a Spike Lee movie and it had a fair bit of swearing in it and I was watching it in English okay and my mother is coming back and forth doing her thing in the around the house and all of a sudden she stops and she says that's what the American soldiers used to say all the time (laughs) and I said what he just said and so I rewind and I played again. <laughs> it was swear words. <laughs> it was swear words. It was really bad. Do I dare say it? No. Uh, it's, it, it's not. Yeah. I, so I'll say the say she the way she said it. <laughs> Goddamn shit, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she remembered the American soldiers were taught her when she was a young kid. How's that for a memory? So right. there you go. So there that was go. her memory. But she, you know, she had like so much admiration for those soldiers and so much uh, gratitude for those right. soldiers because they did, They, you know, she was not a, she was a, 
she grew up pretty poor. And this, with the soldiers came rations, yes. came food, came security. And so it was very important in their life, in her life anyway. My father was a different thing because my father lived in an even more remote village. They were in a farm. They had pigs and chickens and rabbits. They never, they never went hungry, mm-hmm. you know, and they never had American soldiers where he was. But they were, you know, he was just two years older. So she would have been... Uh, in 1942, so she she was 10 because she was born 10. in 32, <clears throat> and my dad would have been 12. But my dad didn't talk about the Americans the way my mom did because mm. she was in a bigger town. And anyway, so there you go. So thank you, American soldiers who uh, taught my mother uh, this. A few, cur- a few curse words. <laughs> a few curse words, yes. <laughs> but it is true. In fact, talking about the liberation of uh, both Corsica and Provence. You have to really begin with what happened in North Africa. And so uh, it was the Allied forces and the Free French forces, directed really by de Gaulle, who uh, chose to in- to invade North Africa. Now, neither of us, as, as Annie has just made a disclaimer, or we are not basically expert historians. But it, it, from what I understand, um, the Germans really did not expect the Allies to go to North Africa, and then they did not expect them to win against the Field Marshal Rommel, who was the head of the huge German army in North Africa. And so what happened was that because the Allies, who I think at that time were really organizing very well, because at first I don't think they were, so you had the Free French forces, you have the uh, English, you have the Americans, and what other other Allied forces joined them uh, as well— uh, by the time they w- took control of North Africa, th- they liberated North Africa officially the 8th of November, 1942. Mm-hmm. And, th- and, they, and, and one group of people that we didn't mention yet is a lot of African soldiers. Right. Because France had a big empire. Right. And de Gaulle, the first thing he did is turn towards the empire and, and say, we need your help. That's right. And he called on a lot of African soldiers to join up and come help liberate Africa. What they call the, t- the tirailleurs. Les tirailleurs. Yeah, the tirailleurs. These were sharp, sharp shooters, right? Uh, from Senegal. And, and they had... And, uh, and Morocco. Yeah. Right. They had a lot of uh, black and Muslim... Um, Foot soldiers. Foot soldiers. You know, a, a exactly. lot of them. Yes. And without them, they wouldn't have been able to do this. So, no. So respect to them as well. Yes, uh, absolutely. And there were uh, thousands and thousands of them who, yeah. who, who were yeah. part of this army. And, and so what happened... Now, the Germans, I really don't know exactly where they were in terms of their ability to imagine whether they were going to win the war or not. But what happened was the North African uh, territories were liberated on the 8th of November, and three days later, on the 11th of November, the Germans came down and occupied the entire southern half of France, which they had not had occupied, be- they had not been occupying before. Right. They rolled here into Toulouse, they rolled the tanks in, they took over Corsica, they took over Provence, and of course what happened was that the they realized that there was going to be another front the front was not just going to be on the east going towards russia it wasn't going to just be on the west uh heading towards the channel and and england all of a sudden there was this third important front which was the south which made for huge uh, battles and they had to really reorganize all, all of their strategy. Yeah, and um, also Mussolini was in bed with Hitler. And Mussolini was in bed with Hitler. And now this is what makes this very strange. So it turns out that from 1940, uh, and the end of 1940 on, the Italians had occupied the island of Corsica. Now, some of you out there may not be able to visualize where Corsica is. Corsica is an island that is actually fairly big, that is really close to the Italian coast and just south of Nice. It is really the extreme southeast, if you want to call it that, of territory that belongs to France because the shortest distance by boat from Corsic to any part of the continental France is, in fact, is in fact Nice. Um, and, and the Italians, of course, uh, their language uh, was very similar to the Corsican dialect. So by having the Italians take over the island of Corsica, it was very easy for the Germans to say, okay, now you just take care of that for us because we don't have to worry about communicating with the local people. And mm-hmm. they, the, there were 
over 60,000 Italian soldiers stationed on the island of Corsica, which wow. is a huge amount. Yeah, Absolutely that's a huge lot. amount. Yeah. And <clears throat> Corsica at the time, having lived on Corsica much later, but knowing a little bit of the history of Corsica, it's hard to imagine that Corsica was probably more uh, backward in technology and poorer than even parts of North Africa. It was a very, very poor population that lived on the island. But they are a very, very independent and very proud group of people. And they do not like being invaded. And this has been <laughs> a part of what's been going on for them for about 2,000 years. It's happened a few times. It's happened a few times, yes. So that is part of the background information. You have the Allied forces who are now prepared to jump across the Mediterranean from basically... Uh, Algeria, from the Morocco too, but largely from Algeria. And you have the Italian forces that have taken over a small section of the southeast of Provence in under the command of the Germans and the island of Corsica. And of course, what the Allies wanted to do, and apparently Annie and I were just talking about this, we're not really sure, but I've been reading some things about how there were lots of disagreements among the leaders of the Allied forces, de Gaulle, Char Churchill, Roosevelt, about where to start in the invasion from the South. And th there was never any real agreement about any of this. I really don't understand if it was just the, the, the group that was the most powerful or who eventually won out in terms of deciding. Eisenhower was over the whole thing and he just he, he decided. He, he just made a they made decision a plan over called, Churchill. They made yeah. a plan called Anvil yeah. that was going to go from the... the The plain of the Po, Le Po, uh, so that's like if you draw Northern a line between Italy. Venice and Turin, yeah, that's the Po River right. goes along there. And they wanted to push from that region north to get to Berlin as fast as possible. Right. But along the way, they were going to run into a lot of Germans, right. uh, a lot of opposition from the Germans. They also had another possibility where from Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, so Greece, And up, mm -hmm. going up to... That was the Balkan part, yeah. Yeah, the Balkan part. Right. Th that pushed towards Germany. Right. The, the thing is, and this is something I'm not sure how many Americans realize this, but this war could not have been won without the help of the Russians. Right. And the Russians were communists. Right. And uh, th they... Heisenauer, um, all of these leaders were very, very worried that in the end, Russia was going to liberate Europe. Right. Because that would have meant communist Europe. Right. And they did not want that. Okay. So they wanted to minimize the place that Russia was going to take in liberating f France uh, and Europe Or in general. Europe in general. Right. Right. It turned out they couldn't have done it without Russia. Uh, certainly the Eastern Front, yes. There's they no did, way they could no. have. But no. what they wanted to do was to... So they, they, they did the liberation of Normandy uh, from the, the northwest. Then they wanted to come from the south up. Uh, but they were like, oh, well, if we came f from the southeast maybe would cut faster than the Russians. That's what Churchill wanted. That's what they wanted, you know. But, but in the end, Heisenhower said, forget that because they needed deep sea ports. They needed deep sea ports. And, and, and not only that, but de Gaulle, who actually had a little bit more of, uh, or I, I'm, I'm translating from the French, let's put it this way. Eisenhower listened to de Gaulle more than Churchill did. Churchill did not trust de Gaulle, and he did not like de Gaulle. And I really am not sure why, because de Gaulle is the only major officer of the French army who actually was re really, really interested in saving uh, France and the French army and, and creating a free French army out outside of the continent. But Eisenhower... Uh, was able to listen to a couple of the generals that worked for and with de Gaulle when they convinced him that they could do the invasion of Italy by starting in Corsica and coming up that way and, mm -hmm. and then hitting into Italy from the south and not necessarily from around the other side, on the eastern side, right, right, towards the Balkans. Right, right. So what happened was they planned first which makes sense because it is the first stop along the way, they decided that the first thing they were going to do was take over the island of Corsica, knowing that it was occupied by the Italian troops, not the German troops. And it is a fact that the Italians, even though they were 
considered to be the enemy, they were not quite as ferocious an enemy as the Germans were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what happened was that there was a French general named Giraud who was in charge of creating a group uh, to organize an, an army that would invade Corsica. Uh, and this has included the, the, the Senegalese, the Moroccans, the Algerians. A huge part of the army was, in fact, a colonial army, mm -hmm. uh, French mm -hmm. colonial army. But what he also did, which was extremely uh, intelligent, was that he got in touch with an officer, um, a, a man who was uh, a, a senior officer in the gendarmerie. And the gendarmerie in France is, is actually military. Yeah. It's part of the military. And uh, this man, his name was Pauline Colonna d'Istria. He was from Corsica. Mm -hmm. But he did not live in Corsica anymore. He was a, a major officer in the Jean, National Gendarmerie. Mm -hmm. But because he had a very good reputation, this general enlisted him to help go with him to Corsica to organize the resistance and to liberate the island. And so to this day, uh, it is considered that it was thanks to this man because what he did was they sent him a, a head onto the island. This makes a really good movie. Maybe somebody's already made it. I have absolutely no <laughs> idea. But he did speak Corsican. And so he went to the island and the island had lots of small resistant groups, these members of the, what they call the Maquis there. You yeah. know? And they were doing these little attacks on the Italians. But what was happening was that there were so many of these Italians that even though there was not too much bloodshed, there would be reprisals every time the resistance groups attacked one of them or attacked a convoy or something like that. And what he did was he convinced all of these little groups. Uh, Corsica is an extremely mountainous island, very... Uh, insular in a lot of ways, and he convinced all of these groups to unite under him as one organization with a, a central leadership, and they worked in coordination with the French army, and in the space of three weeks, they routed the Italians. Wow. That's quite the feat. It was amazing. It was actually uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, they managed to organize in such a way that every place on the island that there was an Italian base of some kind, they were able to take it over. And it happens that luckily for them and luckily probably for all of us, uh, what happened at the same time was that in Italy, Mussolini was arrested. Hmm. He was arrested because he was uh, basically losing the war for the Italians and the Germans no longer had any confidence in him. So he wound up getting arrested And because he was arrested, the, Germ the, the Italian soldiers no longer felt that they had to be loyal to him. I see. Which is kind of hard to imagine, but that's exactly what happened. And so the general, the Italian general on the island of Corsica, his name was Magli. Once Mussolini was arrested, he turned around to his troops and he told them that they were going to sign an armistice with the Allies And that from that moment on, they were going to be uh, allied with the Allies <laughs> and fight against the Germans. Okay. And that, is it, them. and that is exactly what happened. So in the space of three weeks, and de Gaulle... So who, there was no like uh, massive landing of American troops with paratroopers and all of that? There were 400 special forces, mm. the, uh, American special forces, who came ashore from a submarine mm. on the eastern side to help uh, with logistics. Mm. Uh, the British provided in, uh, 25 tons of arms and uh, material of that kind. And uh, they left the major part of the liberation up to the French. Hmm. And of course, the Corsicans, who consider themselves to be not quite French, but kind of French. I mean, that's <laughs> a whole other story. You know? But they, they and the, uh, the French colonial army are really the ones who liberated the island. But what did happen, and this is why it became so important, is that as soon as the island was liberated, de Gaulle got on the radio and he said, this is the first part of continental France to be freed, to be liberated from the invading forces. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, yeah. Then what happened was that 50,000 <clears throat> allied forces, mostly American, within the next few months arrived on the island of Corsica, 
and set up 17 air and naval bases. Ah. And it was from there that they worked on all the logistics for the invasion of Provence and the invasion of Italy. <laughs> and talking about uh, memories, I happened to, by the purest of chance to have lived for a while on Corsica a number of years ago. And I knew somebody, it was kind of a neighbor, who had been a child when the Americans showed up. So right after the liberation. I don't remember, to be honest, how old he was, but he must have been at least eight or nine years old at the time. And he told me that it was the most astounding thing. It was not just the chewing gum and the chocolate, but what they brought with them was cars and trucks and gasoline and all kinds of things that the island did not have. Right, they goods. paved the roads that had not been paved. They took uh, enormous amounts of DDT, which of course now we know is, is dangerous, but at the time certainly was considered to be a miracle product. And they and did the entire eastern coast of Corsica, which is huge marshlands, and nobody lived down by the water because of the mosquitoes. And after they left the island... And they left the island in the beginning of 1945. They left all the material. They left the trucks. They left motor parts. They left gasoline. They mm -hmm. left everything that they could not carry with them, that they mm -hmm. could not transport because they were going into Provence and into Italy. And they left it for the Corsicans to use. And this man, I, for some reason I remember him being named Martin, but I'm not sure if that's what his name was. He said... The Corsicans thought it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. They got rid of the mosquitoes. They <laughs> left them all this gasoline and all of this all material this stuff, equipment. all this equipment stuff. And, of course, it was... Well, a, and roads. And, a, and roads. And, of course, from the point of view, you can think of it as, as waste, you know, it was wastefulness because they had all this stuff and they just left it. But he said for them, it, it was, was wonderful. A, right, right. It was a miracle. Yeah. And I loved the American right. soldiers. Oh, yeah. The American soldiers did a lot to to bring civilization, if you yeah. would like to, I mean, to, you, to, the, to, to play. I mean, Corsica was pretty backwards. It was pretty backwards. It, it still was, is cutting in a way. <laughs> well, it's not nearly as what uh, I have. And I'm going to post it um, too. And, and th there's an article I took off of the New York Times that's from 2008 that talks about uh, a man who was one of these children who experienced the, fr the, the arrival of the Americans who as an adult, uh, once he retired, decided that he wanted to see if he could find some of the Americans that had been on the island of Corsica. And he wrote a book about it. And what the Americans did is they called the island the USS Corsica. And the USS is, of course, the name that they give to a, uh, a ship in their fleet. <laughs> right, right. But it kind of looks like the shape of a ship. It looks like the shape of a <laughs> ship. And they said they wanted to call it that because... The island was unsinkable, and it was basically the largest naval base they'd ever in, had ever, you know, anywhere. <laughs> so it became the, they USS called it officially Corsica. the USS Corsica. That's and right. it is from there that they went on to uh, Provence and went on to Italy. Wow. Okay. So now you're ready for me to talk about the, yeah. the Provence bit. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, and by the way, talking about bunkers, you know, we're going to, yeah, yeah, Annie's yeah. going to mention bunkers. If you go to Corsica, even today, the bunkers are still there. Right. All along the coast. Mm. Wow. Yep. So, in the night from August 14th to August 15th, 1944, 2,200 ships, including 900 warships, 900. left the coast of Italy, Corsica, and North Africa to converge on the shores of Provence. Aboard were Americans, British, and French troops. The French were led by Latre de Tassigny, uh -huh. uh, the Americans by Generals uh, Trescott and Patch. They landed on the shores of Provence between Nice and Marseille. That's Nice and Marseille is 150 kilometers yep, it's of wide. coastline. It's big, yep. okay? And lots of cliffs. Yes. At 8 a.m. on August 15th, this operation was called Anvil at first, but then they renamed it Dragoon, okay? Originally, Operation Dragoon in Provence and 
Operation Overlord in Normandy, in Normandy were scheduled to take place at the same time in early June 1944 in an effort to squeeze the German invader out of France. If you imagine a picture of France in your head, Overlord is, you know, northwest and Dragoon is southeast, southeast. right? So they wanted to squeeze them right out um, uh, of, of France. This was kind of, I mean... We we already mentioned the fact that Churchill was worried about the importance that the Russians might right. take, right. Um, and so they were like, oh, maybe we could go to you know, cut like cut through and don't let so many Russians come help us, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Like, what kind of thinking is that? Anyway. So, the commander-in-chief of the Allied forces in the Mediterranean was General Sir Maitland Wilson. He wanted to do uh, the a massive uh, effort uh, from the Po area, uh, and they decided against that. Eisenhower decided that the Allies did not have the bandwidth to do everything, mm -hmm. you know. At the same time. Right, at the same time. And he decided on Provence. Why Provence? Because they needed deep water ports. Right. Marseille, Toulon were perfect for that. Those are big ports that can accommodate large warships. Going east, uh, the port of Sète, the, so around the Mediterranean, down a little bit to Sète, it's not big enough. No. That port is not big enough. And, there, you know, there's a canal. And right. A I canal, don't think it's very deep. No, right. it's not very deep. And also, a canal can be kind of bombed. Right. You know, it's too, right. it's too easy to... Get, so they decided, no, no, we, we got to go east towards Marseille and, and Toulon because the Americans had a bunch of... Uh, large divisions, and entire divisions that they could put on their big warships yes. and just send them to Marseille, send them to Toulon. Because, you know, if you remember, in Normandy, they had set up a temporary harbor in Aromanche. In Aromanche. It was called Mulberry, Mulberry Harbor. They literally built a fake harbor. They built, yes, uh, kind of off the coast, off like the coast. maybe a mile right. off right. the coast. Uh, because the ports of Le Havre and Cherbourg, which are very deep water, but the thing is they're too far because this was all happening uh, around Utah Beach, right. you know, uh, so that's Saint-Brieuc, Saint-Malo kind of area. And those are not uh, deep water ports. So the operation in Algeria was called Operation torch okay and after that hitler had placed 150,000 soldiers in the provence area and he made it uh, he made keeping the ports of provence one of his main objectives okay the germans built themselves bunkers and a whole wall of the mediterranean just like they had the wall of the atlantic right. there was a wall of the mediterranean all along the, Pro the Provence coast. You had bunkers, cannons, minefields, barbed wires in both Provence they really and, needed to, to defend and Normandy. It, right? Yes. And around the port of Marseille, they positioned 200 of their, the Germans positioned 200 of their major cannons. It's amazing to think about. Yes. Now, the only thing Hitler did not have in Provence was air power. Mm -hmm. And that's how the... The, the Allies were able to take advantage of that. They had some troops, but they had hundreds of uh, planes right. that dropped paratroopers that went everywhere to retake all of these little villages and one by one. I mean, it was just a matter of pushing all of these people out. So when, when Elise and I were discussing this earlier, we looked to see if there are still bunkers right. along Provence, because, you know, I mean... I, it's, the, nothing, it's something I don't remember seeing. Right, I never remember seeing any of those. The thing is, the, the coast in Provence is this white kind of grayish tone, and they blend in. Right. And they, you don't see them. And, they, and, and according to the pictures we saw, they are really right in the middle of the cliffs, most yeah, of them. they're right in the cliffs, and it's, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah. But there are still, there's two that are listed by Google Maps. It's one is called the Blocos des Goudes, mm -hmm. and the other is the Bunker Fabin, which is 
uh, by uh, Saint Jean Cap Ferrat, <laughs> which is <laughs> it's a lovely name, place to be. <laughs> yes, yes, it's unbelievable to think that these places were yes. littered with with things, bunkers, bunkers and, and minefields mm. and cannons right. and mm. barbed wire. Yep. It is so not like Provence. Like, no. And, and actually, the people of Provence did not keep most of this. Like, there's a few of them. And it's not like in Provence. Uh, if you go to Normandy, uh, to go to see th these places, they've built memorials. Right. They've built parking lots. They've made it uh, easy for the public to go see these things. And it's part of their... I would. I mean, I'm, it's not. I'm not saying it in a demeaning way, but it's like part of the folklore now of Normandy, right? To to go and visit these places, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not the same in Provence. Absolutely not. They have not kept near as much. No. They were like, this crap has to go, and we want <laughs> to forget about it. And they just, they just got rid of it. Let's get rid of it. And of yeah. course, it helps that the liberation of Provence was not as cost, costly as far as human deaths right. and and you know it wasn't as difficult because even though there were a lot of german soldiers they were not prepared to they gave up really easily much more easily <clears throat> as i mean the germans never give up anything particularly easily but they yeah. gave up more easily certainly than they did in normandy and yes. more easily than they did in italy as well yes okay. yes so um there's a there's a newspaper called le, le, le La France Libre, it's a daily newspaper, they mentioned, because I learned about this with two, from two sources, there's a very small book by a French general that details all the battles and all the divisions and, you know, with all these beautiful maps with, like, red arrows of movements of troops right. and tanks and That's whatever. That's really for strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really don't understand any of that. But the other way I learned about this is uh, with the French press. I just looked into mm -hmm. old articles in the French press. And so La France Libre mentioned 900 ships and 800 gliders who came to challenge the Mediterranean Wall put in place by a Rommel between Toulon and Marseille. Thursday, so Tuesday at dawn... Uh, so Tuesday was the 15th, uh, a powerful armada of more than 900 ships with French, English, and American flags came to face German batteries. At the same time, hundreds of gliders and 14,000 parachutists wow. landed further inland in Provence. Huh. A majority of those soldiers who landed were either French and or from the French colonies, but there were also a lot of Americans. It's, it's like a, it was. It wasn't quite fifty-fifty, but it was maybe sixty percent French and forty percent Allies. The rest of the Allies. Um, uh, I, I just. I just want to make a comment because that is because of De Gaulle. Because when the Allies went into Italy, De Gaulle wasn't interested in knowing if there was a large, if a large contingent was French. He was so concerned that it was the French who would help liberate France, right. that he insisted that the French soldiers participate. And in fact, it's, a, it's part of the politics of what happened for many years afterwards in relation to the, the relationships between de Gaulle and, the, and, and Churchill and Eisenhower and, and, and everybody else and all those people. Whereas when it came to going into Italy or coming uh, from the north and then going eventually across, it was far fewer French and much more just the Allies. Right, because... The English and the Americans did not trust French troops. No. Okay. They did not. They, they saw them as having surrendered way too fast to the Germans. I would have liked to see what England would have done. Exactly. In our place. Right. If land access was possible. But okay, let's, let's imagine that the French did a terrible, terrible job. But as a result, French, uh, English and American troops as a whole, did not trust the French troops to be as valiant as all that. And so they just decided in Normandy to do without them. Yes. For the most part. Right. Yeah, there were French, a few French soldiers involved, but not that many. Whereas in Provence, it was more than half. It was more than half. Were, uh, were French soldiers. Yeah. So it started on Monday, August 14th, 1944. It's important, right? So a few months after D-Day with heavy bombardments of the ports of Toulon and Marseille and the uh, area east of Cannes. Can you imagine bombing Cannes? <clears throat> anyway, 
Or Nice. Or Nice, yeah. 700, uh, 750 Allied planes were involved. At dawn on the 15th, a whole armada of ships and gliders dropped off soldiers Must have been everywhere. And it was just like Normandy. Just like Normandy. Uh, except that it, they didn't meet as much resistance. This was the first time so many French soldiers fought along with Allied forces hmm. because everywhere else, the French soldiers were kept apart. Things went well, and the Germans did not fight back as much as the Allied feared. Okay. The Germans fought back on land, but they did not send enough planes. And very quickly, several strategic towns and islands were occupied by Allied forces. And unlike in Normandy, very few soldiers died. I hmm. mean, I don't have the numbers, but it was not nearly as deadly in Normandy as it was in... Uh, there, there are... I, I did notice... And I noted down, there is an American cemetery in Draguignon. Oh. And uh, there are, let me see if I can find it. I don't remember. There were, it, it was more, more, there were more people in the cemetery than I thought there would be. I'll have to get the numbers again, but there definitely is an American cemetery in Draguignon. And Draguignon or Draguignon? Draguignon. Draguignon. Yeah, Draguignon. Draguignon. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, there is a British cemetery also somewhere, I can't remember the exact location, but the British cemetery is World War I and World War II soldiers who fell. I see. Whereas the one that's American, it's just World War II. Just World War II. Just World War II. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that would be an interesting place, place of visit. memory to visit. Right. Yeah. So um, right after this operation, General Wilson, who was the English general in charge, mm -hmm. addressed the French nation and said, at this moment, Allied armies are coming to deliver you. I ask you to follow five rules. One, leave the roads clear. The Germans will do what they can do to push you to take your possessions and hit the road. Mm. I ask you not to do so. Mm. Number two, do not cross enemy lines. You would risk your life and you'd make it harder for the allies to prevail. So don't cross enemy lines. Number three, Watch what the Germans are doing. Take, no take note of them, moving equipments and troops. Document everything you witness. Mm -hmm. allied, allied troops may need that information. Number four, be disciplined. If you are in the resistance, obey your superiors. If you are not in the resistance, ask your friends for advice. We do not want individuals to take big risks. Mm -hmm. The whole nation disciplined and united, working with the Allies, can chase the Germans away. And number five, only follow official instructions. Do not act prematurely. Listen to official Allied radio stations. Beware of rumors. Remember that the Allies will not ask you to take excessive risks. The fight has begun. Victory is ours. There you hmm. go. There you go. There you go. So it was it was a really momentous time in the in the liberation of France yep. because 2 months later by then Paris was already free. Yes. But they had lots of other places oh, lots of other to places. liberate because yes. the Germans were entrenched and unfortunately even after Paris was taken uh, by the allied forces there were some horrible things that yes. happened. Yeah. The Germans we're not happy about leaving. No, and, they weren't. And, and they, they committed some atrocities. Atrocities, absolute atrocities, uh, yes. Along yes. the way, right. just, just to get back mm -hmm. at the people. I don't know. It's it's, uh, also, uh, those five rules, they remind me of some of the issues that came up between de Gaulle and the resistance in France that were French resistant movements because... He was, maybe because of his background being a, a, an army officer and all of that, but one of the things that upset him the most and angered him the most and made it difficult was that there were lots of different resistant groups that were mostly, of course, in the south and, and around Lyon, and they didn't always coordinate with one another. And he was, through the entire war tried to convince emissaries to go talk to them, to organize them so that they didn't do exactly what they're talking about in these five rules, which right. is have individual activities that could, could not be controlled, right. basically. Um, it's like a basketball it, game. Yeah. 
You don't want to have too many stars who are who are, right. who are just trying to right. to, to, to to score. Right. right. You know, you have to work together. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Exactly. But it's true that in war, especially a lot of these young men who were eager to get back at the Germans, mm -hmm. they might have done some things that were not quite bright. You know, uh, doing things that and that ended up. Well, Kill. And the, <clears throat> and the reprisals were terrible. You know? Right. So, so you know, it's uh, discipline was lacking in in, yes. in French mentality, and this is something they had to learn the hard way. They had to learn the hard way. Yeah. Yes. It, 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 in fact, it, it, yeah. I mean, there were lots of stories about things that happened later uh, at, towards the end of the war in relation to this, but that's another that's another story for yeah. another time. Yeah. So anyway, so. Um, we wanted to just mention that there was more to the liberation of France than Normandy. Than just Normandy, right. absolutely. There's, you know, the, the liberation of the of Corsica and Provence were vital and the and the role that allied forces played, but also the French the forces, French forces <clears throat> including French forces from the colonies, which were not as um, you know celebrated in the past not and and that uh, just as a, a yes it not as celebrated and recognized by the french oh yeah until recent times because oh, yeah. Yeah. many of them unfortunately uh those who didn't die uh but gave their lives to helping in terms of you know devoting themselves to this were promised pensions that they didn't get for years and years and years right. afterwards so, right yeah. and also the les tirailleurs uh, Senegalais, yeah. they wanted to... So when when the Americans paraded down the Champs-Élysées at uh, the victory, because uh, people must wonder, why do French people always do a ceremony on the Champs-Élysées with the tanks and right. the planes right. and the this and the right. that every 14th of July? Well, it's because the Americans and the Allies walked down the Champs-Élysées in a kind of improvised... Um, uh, celebration, victorious celebration, okay? But they would not let the Senegalese, uh, the tirailleurs, they would not let them join because they were black. Because they were black. Right. Okay, so, but they had been vital in in liberating France. And so... But you uh, have to remember, too, that the Americans almost didn't let de Gaulle and Leclerc walk down the Champs-Élysées. Mm -hmm. And de Gaulle won that round by being the first person to walk down the Champs-Élysées with Leclerc, who was an incredible general. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it was, the politics of this the were politics were, were heavy, bad. Were, were really bad. heavy. Yeah. yeah. And, and the distrust between the French, the English, the Americans, yep. and the fact that the, uh, the English could always point at the, you know, the French retreated way too fast. Yep. And yeah, they did. Um, <laughs> they just, they did. I don't know what to say, you know, and, and maybe they didn't have a bloody choice, but, um, you know. Well, I mean, in other words, the war had more than just battles. It had politics, which yeah. unfortunately, I guess, is always the case. That's always the case. So we learned, we, I hope you, you, we, you learned something listening to this and uh, that next time you're in uh, Provence, maybe if you like hikes in the... Hills the of hills. Provence, those beautiful along the coast, co cliffs. Yeah, the cliffs around Cassis and uh, Marseille and all that. Yep. That's where those bunkers were. Right, and Goud, which is one of the last pieces of technically Marseille, I think, still on the south side. I bet that's the one you can actually see. You can probably yeah. see it. See. So I, I will put a link to the map, mm -hmm. the Google Maps for it in the show notes. And I don't, I don't know how easy it is and to it, hike to it. But. No, I don't know. And if you ever go to Corsica, which is actually a very gorgeous place to go, uh, there the bunkers are still there. Yeah. And, and they are on the beaches. And just like in Normandy, uh, they've just become part of the scenery. It's kind of strange, but there they yeah. are. Yeah. Merci, Elise. Merci, Annie. Au revoir. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you have done it for 
years now. You are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Susan L. Blau and Mike Dorn. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. Elise, how is your Patreon going? My Patreon seems to be going okay. I was very happy with the last couple of episodes, and I think a lot of people liked the Josephine Baker episode particularly. That's great. And uh, the next one coming up, which will probably not be this week, but certainly in the near future, will be about the whole tradition of kissing Les bisous bisous. Oh, les bisous bisous. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime, I would love to thank both Eileen and Paula for joining me on Elise's Corner and becoming new patrons for me. Thank you so very, very much. And I would love to have some more new patrons as well. Of course, of course. And to become a patron of Elise's, you go to patreon.com forward slash Elise Art. So Patreon is P A. T-R-E-O-N. Elise Art is E-L-Y-S-A-R-T. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. I published a new video reward for my patrons this week. This time it was a bike ride in Paris. I started this ride in front of the Hôtel de Ville on Rue de Rivoli. And I rode east, ending just before Place de la Bastille. This is a really popular dedicated bike path in Paris. When COVID started, Parisians turned to cycling because they didn't want to catch COVID in the metro. The mayor realized that it was important to provide dedicated bike paths and closed Rue de Rivoli to most traffic. It became a major way to get east to west in Paris for cyclists. By now, many of the cars are back in some portions of that stretch anyway, but there's a protected bike path and it's very busy with bikes. Pedestrians, watch out for bikes because as you can see in the video, there are a lot of close encounters between bikes and pedestrians. My thanks also to Gail Withers for sending in a generous one-time donation by using the green button on any page on joinusinfrance.com that says tip your guide. I did an itinerary review for Gail and when she got the document, she was so surprised by how detailed and how much work I had put into it that she decided to show her appreciation for that itinerary review, but also for the podcast that she's been enjoying for several years. Thank you so much, Gail. Bon voyage. You're going to have a great time in Paris. And I'll try to get Gail on the podcast because I need trip reviews, guys. <laughs> If you're visiting Paris or France in August and September 2021, I want to hear from you. Email me, annie at joinusinfrance.com. So another way to support this podcast is to hire me to be your itinerary consultant. It's a popular service. I'm fitting as many in as possible each week, and I'm constantly surprised how many orders I'm getting. What is it that buyers uh, like about it? Well, you get an itinerary that fits your needs anywhere in France. You get the most current information about travel restrictions and how to handle them. You have my recommendations all organized in, in writing. Then you get to ask all your questions when we get on the phone for an hour. That's a lot better than any guidebook I've ever heard of. So it's no surprise that the service is popular. The only trouble is that when my calendar is full, it's full. So if that's something you'd like for your next trip to France, take a look at joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. And remember, there is a line. I want to do a French tip of the week today. I haven't done in one in a while. Okay. On n'a pas élevé les cochons ensemble. This is important, not so much as a phrase that you'll use in everyday conversation, but rather it speaks to the French social mores and culture. French people are a lot more standoffish than Americans. We do not like it when Americans treat us like we're bosom buddies when we just met them. On n'a pas élevé les cochons ensemble means we did not raise pigs together. Imagine kids long ago in a French farmhouse. They're not brothers, but they might as well be because they raised the pigs together. They can skip the formalities and go straight to slapping each other on the back and teasing one another. Not so with people you've just met, at least not in France. You need to stay formal with people you've just met, 
especially people in the service industry. Be formal and respectful and they'll treat you right. No walking in the lobby and saying salut to the person at the desk. Bonjour is the word you want, and bonjour madame, bonjour monsieur is even better. In other words, never ask us how's it hanging, okay? That's the fastest way to be categorized as a rude American because after all, on n'a pas élevé les cochons ensemble. This week in French news, the types of people getting vaccinated in France is changing rapidly. People who work vaccination centers say they've gone from vaccinating people who couldn't wait for their shot to vaccinating teenagers who are so stressed about getting poked with a needle that they faint. People who worry about things that are as likely to happen as getting hit by a meteorite. Guys who go on and on about how they'd never do this if their boss wasn't forcing them. They even see people who ask if this is going to change their DNA and all of that. Vaccination centers are doing God's work for sure. And while we have people working out the fastest way to start this vaccination process so they can get back to work and school and whatever, we have all sorts of people who are demonstrating against public health measures. These people make up a fraction of the population, maybe 1%, I would guess, but they are very vocal. And they all have one thing in common. They hate Macron. Some of them will get more and more entrenched. And they will have to make big, big changes in their life over this little silly vaccination thing. Because there are lots and lots of employers who are saying, you must be vaccinated or you cannot work here. Can you imagine going through nursing school, working for years as a nurse, and then, oh, well, I'd rather not do this job than be vaccinated. Or or even a professional, like you're a software person, and all of a sudden you got to go work in the field somewhere. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just crazy what people will do f in, in, you know, for for their politics. And that is just, just, yeah, makes no sense. But you know what? So be it. At least they will not be sitting in the same basketball arena as me. They're not going to get into the restaurants. They won't get into the gym. It's their choice. It's silly. There's no need for it, but it's their choice. For my personal update this week, I'm off to explore the town of Bergerac tomorrow. We've booked a room at the Hôtel de France, and we'll spend some time with a friend who grew up there and will show us around. The weather should be good, not too hot. It hasn't been a super hot summer in France. Temperatures are a bit below normal, actually, but I won't complain. I do enjoy a mild summer. More about Bergerac in an episode soon. And by the way, the hotel is not a freebie. Whether this hotel and town are spectacular or dismal, I'll give it to you straight. But since I'm taking a long weekend, it's been a short work week, right? So nothing much beside work has happened. I'm sure I'll have more to share next week. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfriends.com for slash 349, the numeral, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed as well as links to relevant resources. And if you enjoy the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. Next week on the podcast, an episode about buying property from plants in France. Not an existing property, but buying a new apartment or a new house that is yet to be built. It turns out that it's quite different from buying an existing property, and I'll tell you all about it with the help of a listener who has done it. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. And remember, I want more trip reports. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.